Coming up, updates from Maston Space Systems. Could the closest exoplanet be habitable? I've got an interview with Liam Kennedy, the creator of ISS Above. <laughs> and I've got comments. Join us for this episode on tomorrow. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? And welcome to Orbit 10.19. I am Carrie and with me is Jared and Mike and Dada. Oh, and I also have a Tim and a Ben and a Liam. I've got a lot of things going on, so hopefully we can kind of like... It's crowded in here. It's today. a little crowded in here. It's a little <laughs> warm today. I'm not sure how you guys are feeling, yeah. uh, but but it's good. It's good. It's always I... crowded in here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Sad hologram. Uh, <laughs> before we get started, though, I want to make sure that we thank all of our patrons of the Escape Velocity. These are the people who have contributed $10 or more for this particular segment of this particular episode, and I feel like it's getting a little crowded in there as Good. well. Ha-ha! Soon your names will be very, very <laughs> tiny and very hard to read. So enjoy this moment while I waste time so you can actually read your name on the screen. If you would also like to read your name on this screen in a not-so-crowded kind of manner, please feel free to head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. Woo! Hey. All right. Goodness, we Did are making it. up for last week of the lack of launches situation with, thankfully, some launches. So, <laughs> Hologram, would you uh, like to fill us in on what's, uh, what's going on? So yeah, we had uh, two launches this week, the first of which was from SpaceX and their Falcon 9. So uh, let's go ahead and check out the footage of that. This Falcon 9 rocket launched on Monday, May 15th at 2321 Coordinated Universal Time from Launch Complex 39A, excuse me, from Cape Canaveral, Florida. And it launched in the expendable configuration, meaning no landing legs and no landing attempt of the first stage, so that they could get the very heavy payload into orbit because it needed all of the available energy. The payload was a, a Cobman concept uh, connecting aircraft, ships at sea, and uh, mobile users over Europe, but part of a global network. This was the fourth satellite in the fifth generation network of ComSats for the British company Inmarsat, based on the Boeing 702 HP satellite butts. After the uh, Falcon 9 second stage reached a parking orbit, and after that short coast that you saw sped up, the second burn was completed, putting the satellite into an elliptical geosynchronous transfer orbit, and over the next 10 days, the satellite's going to be using its own onboard thrusters to uh, uh, be circularizing its orbit in a uh, geosynchronous orbit over Europe. So congratulations to SpaceX for that successful launch. Yeah, it is always nice to have a launch at that time of day. It's just like these gorgeous views. Oh, like, I mean, if you don't appreciate launches anyway, those sunsets in Florida are just so, so pretty. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Because uh, a couple of people were like, oh, I, I was sort of distracted by the pretty views. I didn't even notice that there was no legs or I didn't notice that there was a logo on it and all these different things. <laughs> like, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of pretty in Florida sometimes. <laughs> uh, I'm a little partial as uh, I was born there. Anyway, uh, there was another launch, though, Mr. Mike. There was. What was, yes. uh, what was going and, on there? Uh... This one was a Soyuz launch, the Europeanized uh, Soyuz launching Ooh. from French Guiana, um, uh, the Corot Spence Center. So let's check out the footage of that. And something that I really like in the footage is something they've started doing of this graphic overlay of the oh, payload yeah. over the real footage, cool. too, and kind of give it a description there. I really, really like that. But uh, in any case, let's go ahead and, and uh, check out the um, launch itself. That this thing got one, two, uh, Stop, décollage, lift off.
This was a Soyuz ST-A rocket, which launched on Thursday, May 18th at 1154 Coordinated Universal Time. And the payload was the SES-15, a KU band comsat providing Wi-Fi for airlines and some TV broadcasting over North America. Now, the SES-15 also <laughs> carries a hosted payload built by Raytheon to improve GPS navigation over the United States. Now, after a successful parking orbit was achieved, the payload and the uh, Frega upper stage coasted for five hours before placing SCS-15 into a geosynchronous transfer orbit. And why not go all the way to GEO? And the reason they didn't was so that the Fregat could deorbit. And on screen there, you're actually seeing the third stage, the J stage, and now you're seeing the Fregat igniting. And then later, after they uh, had that coast, they finally were able to deploy the satellite, uh, which is also based on a Boeing 702 SP satellite bus. So basically this week, we had two similar satellites, both built by Boeing, that uh, launched this week. And here's the pictures. This is in March Sat uh, 5, uh, the, the, the fourth flight of that. And this one is SES-15. And other than the uh, different types of antennas for the KA or the KU band, I uh, can't really tell the difference. So <laughs> pretty cool to, to see that. <laughs> yeah, 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 very cool. And, uh, that footage. Yeah, you're right. That overlay just kind of telling you like what's going on with, you know, how everything's kind of packaged up in the fairing. That was really, really mm -hmm. cool. And then some of that footage yeah. was just like everything kind of floating away oh, from you and oh, like so breaking gorgeous. apart. And, oh yeah, really, really amazing. Uh, cameras have come a long way yes. when it comes they to- have. Uh, Turns they out. Have. I know, yeah. how weird. All right, so uh, <laughs> Jared, speaking of satellites. Yes, <laughs> good transition. That was a good one. Yeah. So. Thanks. That's the, yeah. probably the best thing you'll get out of me this whole show. No. Uh, no be <laughs> speaking of satellites, particularly one that we don't necessarily talk about a lot, uh, what yeah. is going on? We got to go all the way out to the Kuiper Belt to talk about this satellite because right. this one is a brand new discovered, brand spanking new moon that we know of. So we love our dwarf planets here at mm -hmm. Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got a dwarf planet, the largest one without a name, 2007 OR10. What a lovely place. Uh, my favorite. It is actually the largest mm -hmm. non-named object in the solar system. It's about uh, 1,280 kilometers across. So wow. it's big. I mean, yeah. it's like one third or qu uh, three quarters the size of Pluto. So mm -hmm. um, it's good size. It's also one of the reddest objects out there as well, likely due to the exposure of methane ice to ultraviolet radiation. So when you expose it, it turns red into these things called tholins, which is pretty cool chemistry. Now, it took three space-based observatories to actually confirm this, but they f did get the imagery back. That shows that it does have a moon. And it wasn't very hard to find the moon because there's a big red circle around it out in space. <laughs> I'm just kidding How about convenient. That. So yes, um, but we used Hubble invisible light, Herschel in far infrared, and Kepler as well invisible light. Um, now, its moon, um, as we said, uh, 2007 OR10 and its moon are a part of the Kuiper Belt, which is this re region of icy leftovers from the solar system's formation about 4.6 billion years ago. So because of that, its orbit is way, way out there. So oh, here wow. is your solar system, your standard solar system, with uh, the different orbits that we have right there. We start with Jupiter and then Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto in purple there. We've got Eris, which is one of the, which is the next largest, uh, the second largest dwarf planet. And then we've got 2007 OR10 in yellow right there. So you can see it goes way further out than Pluto. They're about three times the distance that Pluto is at its maximum. Mm -hmm. So um, it is way, way out there. Now, what's so cool about this is that we're finding that basically all, all of these big dwarf planets that we know of out there have moons. And that provides evidence to support the widely approved hypothesis of solar system formation that we have that we know is what's called late heavy bombardment. So this was a time uh, from 4.1 to 3.8 billion years ago when a whole bunch of stuff in the solar system was smashing into each other. Okay. So this, this pro helps provide that evidence of it because it shows that that with this moon and the way it orbits and the way 2007 OR10 rotates as well, which it rotates very slowly, um, it shows that this was likely formed from an impact as opposed to a body coming into the gravity of the dwarf planet and being captured that way. Hmm. So the moon is roughly 300 kilometers across and it orbits at about 15,000 kilometers above the surface of 2007 OR10. So 
very cool result that we were able to get by using the power of three space observatories. Nice. So, yeah. That's really cool. Uh, I like how very I think cool. it was Therian Theron uh, in the chat room was talking. I was calling it Orton because mm -hmm. of O R T E N. Mm -hmm. Uh, Orton, I like that. That makes me giggle. Uh, all right. <laughs> Is that how, like, some of these, I mean, I understand that there's designations and you have to designate things, but, like, eventually, <laughs> once they get names, they do get, like, names, right? Or no? Yeah, they, it, it, it actually, um, it was, well, 2007 OR10 was discovered in 2007 sure. by Mike Brown and his team at Caltech, the Pluto Killer. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. uh, it has to be named, he can suggest a name by November 2019. Okay. So that's, that's he, he is the only, him and his team are the only people who can suggest a name. Because they but, found it. But yeah, but once November 2019 rolls around, mm -hmm. anybody can suggest a name to the International Astronomical Union, as long as it sticks within the nomenclature that we want of... Uh, of uh, the Kuiper belt objects out there. So, so Kuiper McKipe face, probably not. Kuiper McKipey face. Right. That doesn't like, sound really very pleasant. Okay. So, yeah. Just checking. Yeah, I don't think we so. Use a lot of we use a lot of mythology, uh, mythological gods as names, and I'm not yes. really sure the pattern that they're using with the Kuiper belt objects. Uh, we have some Hawaiian, some yeah. Indonesian. Like, exactly, yeah. There's specific island gods that they're using? Can yeah. be any type? Basically, the uh, uh, Polynesian and Oceanic gods, if you will, are what they what they use to name the Kuiper belt objects. So, huh. yeah, it's really cool that we actually specifically specify certain things yeah. for certain names, <laughs> so. Ah, I like it. Pretty cool. All right, I'm, I'm uh, yeah, all right, I'm in. Uh, okay, so, uh, Mike, you have some interesting updates from a few yeah. people. I, I don't want to step over on this one. Uh, just hit me, what, what, have we, what do you got going on? So first off, there was some updates the, with some rocket engine developments uh, to replace the RD-180. Um, first off, this uh, or rather uh, on Sunday, Blue Origin announced that they had had a mishap with a, a very important piece of hardware for their test program for their BE-4 engine. Mm -hmm. The piece of hardware that they uh, had a problem with was a power pack, which you see on screen there. Mm -hmm. Now, what's a power pack? It's, it, it's a set of turbo pumps and valves that provides all the fuel oxidizer mix that goes into the injections or, or the injectors and the combustion chamber of a liquid rocket engine. So this is where all the fuel is pumping through and getting pressurized to uh, the level that it needs to be at. Now, uh, Blue Origin recently shipped a completed engine to their Texas site for a full-scale test, but uh, thankfully, uh, whatever damage was caused, if there was any damage uh, for, for the uh, whatever accident they had with that power pack, is isn't going to delay their program because they have a second test stand that they can do these tests on with the BE4 engine. Thanks. Now, they plan to certify the engine by the end of this year, and the hope is to use it on United Launch Alliance's Vulcan rocket and eventually their own new Glenn rocket. And flights with this engine could begin in 2019. Now, meanwhile, their competitor for uh, replacing the RD-180 is Aerojet Rocketdyne, and they have completed their critical design review of their AR-1 engine. Uh, they hope to be able to certify the engine by 2019 and have uh, the first ones ready for flight in 2020. Now, uh, they also recently completed testing of their pre-burner engine for the AR-1, uh, which drives the, per the, the turbo pumps and makes sure that there uh, isn't any excess fuel that uh, uh, builds things up. So they've been wrapping up the tests for the, the, the pre-burner there, and they've also completed testing of the major fuel pump system, the kick pump, and they've been able to have it pump fuel at around 75,000 revolutions per minute, which is the fastest speed for any hydrocarbon pump to date. Um, so with that work, those are the individual pieces of the, the power pack that uh, Blue Origin recently had uh, 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 an accident with. But in any case, uh, AR, uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne is still on schedule and uh, is you know, only about a year behind Blue Origin, even though Blue Origin got a two-year head start on their engine development. So hmm. uh, pretty cool with that. And uh, there's the, uh, the, the kick pump that I was talking about just oh, a moment yeah. ago. So. Wow. Yeah, um, so that was with the pre-burner kind of makes up the, the same pieces. I know there's a lot of pieces there, and, it, and uh, we could go through and explain what each one does, but we don't have a little complicated. That, wow, yeah, that's yeah. why I'm not a rocket scientist. It's rocket science. Yeah. Sure. Oh, my goodness. Uh, that's, yeah, <laughs> right. that's really crazy. That's really cool, though. And I liked... I, while they're not, like, in uh, 
cooperation by any means, like the competition-ish kind of situation that's going on there is really interesting because I think, I feel like it spurs a little bit more creativity and, um, you know, purpose, right? Like you have, you don't yeah. just have your own deadline. It's like now you're trying to fight against somebody else as, as well. You know what I'm saying? I don't mm-hmm. know. I always think that that's really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of the reason I like to talk about this stuff is because Jared talks about all these really awesome places out in the universe, but mm-hmm. I'm just like, well, we can't even get to these places, so that's why I focus on image development, <laughs> yes. so that we can get to other places like what you're about to talk about. Yeah. No, I'll write an AR one. To... It's a great, uh, yeah, we, yeah, it's a, you know, you've got hardware, you have astro things. <laughs> Astro things. Well, I was like, you don't have software. Like I feel No, I don't. Like, but it is an interesting balance that between you two. Cosmology. The, the cosmology. The cosmology. And I went to cosmetology school, so somewhere I fit in the middle. What do you know? Uh, <laughs> Jer- Jared's got the destination, Mike's got the vehicle to get exactly. there. Exactly. Yes. And I'm literally just along for the ride. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> speaking of going places, possibly, eventually, uh, Jared, where, where's uh, one of the closest places we might go? Oh, to? well, you're talking about uh, Proxima Centauri B. Oh, well, I mean, who isn't? <laughs> yeah, who wouldn't? <laughs> so Proxima Centauri B is the closest exoplanet that we know of. Yay. It goes around the closest star that we know of called Proxima <laughs> Centauri, a mere 4.2 light years away or about... Uh, gosh, uh, geez, really far away. It's, it's still really far away. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, that's true. Yeah. Oh, well. So, this was announced last year that they discovered this planet, and they did it using the European Southern Observatory's 3.6 meter telescope and exquisite data of what's called radial velocity method to find the star. So, basically, they looked at Proxima Centauri and they detected a wiggle back and forth from the star. Now, this is, this is, 4.2 light years away. That's mm-hmm. that's a pretty significant distance. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what's the resolution of the wiggle that we're able to detect? Well, it turns out that Proxima Centauri is wobbling at a speed of about two meters per second. Ooh. And we're detecting that over tens of trillions of kilometers away. So it's what, really, what does really Earth far. wiggle at? Um, Earth causes our sun to wiggle at about two meters per second. All right, cool. So now roughly. I have some sort of reference. Thank but, you. But you also would have to combine all the planets together, and sure. then when you do that, our sun wiggles at somewhere on the order of about 110 meters per second. Gotcha. So, yeah, so we're a very insignificant part of what makes our sun wiggle. Um, but, uh, cool thing, Proxima Centauri b orbits 7.5 million kilometers away from Proxima Centauri, but because Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf star, that planet can actually be closer. So you can actually have Proxima Centauri be sitting in the habitable zone of that star, even though it only orbits w- around that star once every 11 days and five hours. So it's a very quick orbit around there. Now, the study was done by a team, I'm probably gonna mess this up, and it's from England too, which is gonna make it even more embarrassing, um, but the University of Executor, I hope I'm saying that right. Mm. Um, Huh? Exeter. 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 Thank you. Yes. So a a team at the University of Exeter and meteorological experts at the United Kingdom's Met Office have taken the first crack at what Proxima Centauri B's weather and habitability may actually be like. So they use something called the Unified Model, which is a climate model that we use to predict the Earth's weather very accurately um, here. And they had two scenarios that they ran. One where it was tidally locked, so one side of the planet always faces uh, Proxima Centauri. And then they had another one where it was 3-2 resonance, which basically means Proxima Centauri rotates three times for every two orbits. So, surprise everybody, both scenarios found that you can actually have relatively stable climates on this planet. So um, that's really cool. Yeah, that's really cool. On but, either side. Yeah, on, uh, not on either side. Um, the stable climate. On the side that faces towards the sun. Or? Uh, so on the tidally locked one, the stable climates are actually along that sunset sunrise area. So that strip right along the day night boundary is where the habitable areas are at. Um, because if you're directly under this, if the, if you're directly, if the sun or if Proxima Centauri is directly above you in the center of the side that faces, you're getting cooked. Um, if you're in the night side of Proxima Centauri, because no uh, en- any kind of energy reaches there, um, it's very cold. The atmosphere literally freezes to the surface um, on that side. So you have to do it right on the day-night boundary, but it works. And then in 3-2 resonance, they found that that also works as well, very strangely, all over the planet. 
So, um, oh, wow. so the possibility of habitability is actually very good uh, for this, except for the problem that Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf star. Um, and of the spe specific flavor it is, a type M star, uh, they tend to spit out a lot of radiation in flares. Ah. So, um, so if there is life there, it's got to be really radiation tough. So. And our sun, just again for reference. Yeah, our, our sun is, is a type G star. Gotcha. So, yeah, it's pretty All right. cool. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> See, I learned something today. There you go. That makes me happy. Mm -hmm. um, so, <laughs> Mike, let's talk about somebody that we haven't talked about in a while, but we know and love dearly and Dreamy Ben has a day. huge man crush on <laughs> and a bet that he yeah. might have lost to. Uh, let's talk about Mast in Space a little bit. Yeah, and I hope that he can. I hope that Dave Masson can come on and talk about this and, and other things uh, with us soon. But uh, apparently, they had an accident last month with their Zero B vehicle, mm -hmm. and uh, it suffered some sort of crash. Um, they're kind of limited on what they can say. Masson said that they can't really talk about much because on that particular flight, they were doing an experiment for DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Mm. And he said that we have a press release pending DARPA approval, but we haven't been able to say much about what we're doing. We can say, though, that the vehicle was not destroyed. There was no fireball, explosion, or fire associated with the event, with the event and we have no plans to repair the vehicle at this time. Now, uh, Zero B flew 75 times, but Mastin still has their zombie, uh, which can fly to, which has flown 227 times. Awesome. And their newest one, the Zodiac vehicle, which uh, has flown 81 times. Um, but uh, in kind of more good news about Mastin, though, they have completed a 13 month design, build, and test period for their most powerful rocket engine to date, the Broadsword 25. Now, uh, the Broadsword 25 is a 3D printed liquid oxygen and liquid methane rocket engine that has a full throttle sea level thrust rating at 25,000 pounds of thrust, or uh, um, uh, about 11 tons of uh, thrust at, at sea level. Nice. Um, now, uh, the reason that they're developing this engine, it's going to be used for their Zephyr space plane idea mm -hmm. for DARPA's XS-1 space plane program. Uh, but the engine could be used as uh, not only a boost stage, but also an upper stage engine for multiple different rockets. Uh, so uh, they could market this engine by itself if uh, this vehicle doesn't take off. But I really like their idea, and I hope that Mastin gets their own <laughs> space plane, too. That would just be awesome. That would be really, really cool. <laughs> the more space planes, the merrier. Pretty much. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's, space yeah. planes are the best. That's so awesome. So, yeah, hopefully Dave Mastin can come on himself and explain to us why this engine can be so efficient, not only at sea level, but also really, really high in the atmosphere to work as an upper stage or Ooh. a boost engine. So, please come on the show again, Dave. We miss you. Come on, Dave. It's time for the annual time for you to come on the show. Yeah, I suppose it is. It is right about that time, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, we should just have like, we should have a Mastin month, right? Like March is Mastin month. Uh, Mastin madness. Or May. I I don't know. March we get, Mastin. We, we should definitely figure that one out. Uh, okay. Uh, so Jared, speaking of Earth and its wiggle and wobble. We have some flashing going on? Yeah, the Earth is flashing um, <laughs> for, for space. So, what is happening? Um, okay, on that start. <laughs> so, uh, first I want to start with this really cool video, yeah. which is a whole bunch of images from Galileo that it took in 1990 when it did a gravitational assist around the Earth. So look at this video. Isn't this so cool? Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's so awesome. So, this was... Like that's I said, from take, 1990. That's from 1990. It has been cleaned up a little bit. I will admit that. <laughs> that's why it's so oh, okay, okay. But um, <laughs> the, the it took this incredible imagery of the Earth when it was zipping past us um, on a gravitational assist on its way to Jupiter. But in this imagery, there are flashes that are seen that only appear on land, but not anywhere near known bodies of water. Now Carl Sagan called them specular reflections, and uh, <laughs> they are—they were this mystery that we really didn't uh, understand for quite a while. Then came a mission that was launched in 2015 called Deep Space Climate Observatory, mm -hmm. uh, also called Discover. It was launched to the L1 point, so that gravitational balance between the Earth and the Sun. And Deep Space Climate Observatory carries an instrument on board called EPIC which I'm sure Ben likes that name. Um, it stands for Earth Polychromatic Imaging Camera. Mm. And basically what it does is it takes a full disk image of the Earth multiple times a day and then sends that down for us to take a look at it. So 
Scientists looked at that imagery from Epic and they found that the mysterious specular reflections were there as well. So it wasn't a flaw in Galileo's imaging system. It was an actual thing um, that was Whoa. occurring. So they looked really closely at all of the data that came back from it and found that those specular reflections come from the exact same angle. And then what we're seeing, this is their idea of what we're seeing, is that we're literally seeing sunlight reflecting off of ice particles in high altitude cirrus clouds. Now this is really cool simply because... Wait, is that almost like a reverse uh, aurora borealis to a certain extent? Um, no, not really, because the auroras have to deal with uh, charged particles hitting the atmosphere. Okay. So this is just basically like, um, like uh, you know, sunlight reflecting off of a car window in sure. your eyes. It's sure. really annoying. Um, it's kind of like the same thing, except it's reflecting off of the ice particles that make up uh, cirrus clouds at very high altitudes. Hmm. So very cool stuff. The, the reason this is That's so cool yes. is because there are exoplanet scientists out there who are actually looking into this as a means by which to look at the surfaces of exoplanets when we get the technology in the next decade or two to actually start being able to resolve exoplanets directly. Hmm. So they're using this as sort of a pre-prep for what to look for when we're looking at exoplanets. Interesting. And it's just so cool because when Galileo did that flyby in 1990, they actually did experiments to see if a spacecraft could detect uh, signatures of life, sure. like like uh, chlorophyll, um, changes in radiation output, light wavelengths, um, and radio signal g gathering as it went past. And here we are, you know, almost 27 years after the flyby, still getting great data from that flyby. Huh. So, really cool stuff. That is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> neat. <laughs> How neat is that? That's pretty neat. <laughs> That's pretty neat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so, Mike, Another another update on what's going on with Commercial Crew? Yeah. Um, so uh, this isn't necessarily from NASA. This is from the, uh, the United States Government Accountability Office. Mm -hmm. And they recently re uh, released a report uh, for all of the major activities that NASA is doing. But I wanted to kind of focus on their review of the commercial program today. And there was a lot of stuff they covered. And uh, I hopefully will be able to put a link to that in the description so that those of you watching can uh, check it out for yourself. Totally. But uh, as far as commercial crew goes, um, According to the Government Accountability Office, both partners are behind schedule, and both of them are at risk of slipping their certifications into late 2018 and not to start operations until 2019. Now, both companies have been given a little bit more money to help with this. They are still fixed price contracts, but NASA has given them more money for new requirements that they have added. And for Boeing, the biggest struggle has been meeting the crew safety standards for their Starliner vehicle. Hmm. Even the engine that is going to be used on the Atlas V is giving them trouble, since they need to account for both the RD-180, mm -hmm. the BE-4, or the AR-1 uh, for their design to launch on the Atlas V, because one of those engines is going to replace the Atlas V, and they don't aren't even sure if they're going to be launching on one of them with the RD-180, probably at least one or two, um, but then they'll be switching over to the other engines. So they need to accommodate for that because the Atlas V will be slightly changed depending on which engine they use. For the BE-4, the bottom of the rocket, the engine housing will be a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. Or for the AR-1, the tanks will be a little bit longer. So they have to design their vehicle to accommodate all of those changes. That's and just redesigns. Yeah. <laughs> so even though it's good to have competition, there's this extra level of com uh, complexity for Boeing. Yeah. Now, the redesigns or the new standards given by NASA has caused most of the delays. And this isn't anything new right now. I mean, they've been giving these new uh, 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 changes over the years. And the Government Accountability Office says that Boeing just kind of lacks information to make a lot of the timely decisions that they need to keep their vehicle on, on track. Sure. Now, uh, for for SpaceX, they have had to make changes to satisfy NASA in regards to the micrometeorite shielding on their vehicle, as well as other things. Um, uh, but the as right now, the Government Accountability Office recommends that no further changes or new re safety requirements uh, be sent from NASA, especially since uh, later in the report when they're talking about Space Launch System, NASA isn't even holding up Orion and Space Launch System up to the same safety standards as they are the Dragon and the Starliner. So, you know, the Government Accountability Office is saying, all right, no more new requirements. Like, they are already, you know, pushing it. Yeah. Um, they also pointed out 
out, though, that in the first four years of the commercial crew program, um, it was horribly underfunded. And it, they commended both of the partners for having made as much progress as they have. And lastly, thanks to Boeing uh, and their deal that they got with the whole um, sea launch uh, fiasco and, and uh, their settlement for getting the money back, um, they have been given seats for the Soyuz vehicle, and they will be able to sell those to uh, NASA uh, to continue flying astronauts to the International Space Station in 2019. Um, but also Russia has uh, um, kind of, Russian officials have said that they're more than happy to sell us more seats, uh, but in kind of like a, How weird. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Must be nice to be it's the a, only it's a ticket weird to ride. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that kind of sucks. Uh, but you know, all ships rise with the so, tide, and of course, at the same time, you don't want anybody to, uh, you know, to be pushed too hard, too fast, uh, too long, because uh, that's how sometimes mistakes get made. So yeah, uh, yeah, and that's something else that they brought up. And even though we kind of knew a lot of this information, I really like these reports from the Government Accountability Office because it kind of. Uh, brings you into reality and connects all the dots together and it's just like here is what we think is actually going on and the recommendations they give a lot of times are followed by NASA so I really like this and uh, um, hopefully they even with these delays I still think that everything will be okay with those extra seats that Boeing has and everything else I, I think we'll be fine but it's still a weird situation yeah, <laughs> yeah. it is cool uh, all right oh, all right again our new segments are so full, and I so enjoy them. Chock full of goodness. <laughs> so much stuff to digest. Uh, so, given all that, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, Ben is going to be giving an interview or having an interview with Liam Kennedy, who's created the ISS Above. This one's going to be really good and a yeah, lot of fun. Cool. A lot of visuals for you guys in this one. So, <laughs> stay with us. We'll be right back. Close your eyes and picture your favorite city. What do you see? A graceful skyline of towering buildings. Cars and trains bustling everywhere. Crowds of people working, shopping and visiting, maybe for the first time. Tomorrow sees cities a little differently. We see buildings, but also a thriving ecosystem. We hear the cars, the trains, and envision a better way. We see cities as a place to call home, and as a place worth the journey. Cities with a past and a present, but especially a bright future. Come with us and explore the cities of tomorrow. And welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get started with this segment of the show, I did want to give a huge shout out to the patrons of Tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who have contributed $10 or more. They're our Escape Velocity patrons. We've also got our Orbital patrons. These are people who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of Tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com. Slash T-M-R-O. All right, we are joined by Liam Kennedy, the creator of ISS Above. We've actually known each other, other for quite a while, and you've been doing um, space out, outreach for uh, as long as I've known you, uh, trying to get people excited about um, uh, looking up, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, so before we get into what ISS Above is, um, tell me a little bit about uh, some of the outreach and like why you think this is important. Why, why should we be doing any of this? Sure. So... Um, People may notice when they hear my accent that I'm not from around here. <laughs> and uh, I grew up in, in, uh, uh, in England. Mm -hmm. And strangely enough, it wasn't until I moved out to California and suddenly had these amazingly clear skies that we have seemingly, uh, you know, all throughout the year, I suddenly got inspired to really get involved in astronomy. Sure. And I became president of Orange County Astronomers and I was president back in 2001, 2002, and we did a lot of outreach. So we would take telescopes to schools, and we would you know, bring uh, inspiration for what you can see with your own eyes through a telescope in town um, to the public and to students. And throughout all of that situation, uh, there was one thing that was common. Whenever the International Space Station was passing by, um, I would 
uh, find a way to, you know, put that into the outreach for that evening. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's this whole thing that the public are not interested in space. Yeah. I, I, yeah, so, you know, that's like a common, common sort of thread of thought. Mm -hmm. In those situations, when people get present to what they can see themselves, it becomes relevant. And suddenly what happens is the public really, you, you see the inspiration is just one step away. It's not like you have to do, it's not like you have to work hard to have people be in awe of what they can see if they only know it's there to see. So, and it could be anything like the craters on the moon. Mm -hmm. It could be the rings around Saturn. When you actually see that for yourself, your own eyeball up to a telescope and you realize that that bright star in the sky is actually not a star, but it's the planet Saturn, and you can see those crazy rings, mm -hmm. you suddenly get, re you realize that it's not just a book, it's not just a scientist who's telling you that it's up there, it's you, you get connected with it. And that's sort of also where the space station comes into it, because most people are just not aware that the space station is passing by so frequently, and that's the place where human beings have been living for the last 16 and a half years and passing us all by five to eight times every day. Uh, you had an interesting quote before the show. You said you were in front of a, a bunch of kids uh, and you blew their mind with uh, statistics on how, how many humans have and how long they've been on space station. Yeah, so, um, so we'll get into my, the product sure. that I use to help you know, have, uh, have me get this outreach happen in the world, sort of all around the world. We'll get into that in a minute, but uh, I give presentations at schools regularly um, throughout the month. And uh, when we're with an audience, especially of middle school students and below, mm -hmm. some high school and below, um, what I get them present to is that there has not been one day of their life that there haven't been human beings passing them by in space every single day, uh, five to eight times every day. Um, because another common thing is that since Apollo, you know, the public has really sort of uh, not maintained an interest in the fact that we actually have human beings in space all the time. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Apollo program, which was extraordinary, and in fact that's the reason, that's really the reason why I'm here, is because of that event, landing on the moon, you know, just, just had me get involved in all of this and be interested in this in this way. But when people get present to the fact that there are the only human beings in our species are passing you by, you know, at home, you're sitting, you're sitting in your seat, you've just got to get present to that every single day, those astronauts are passing you by. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm old enough where uh, there have not been humans um, pre in, present in space for my entire life, mm. uh, but I do find that statistic absolutely remarkable. Someone born in the year, what, 2000 essentially, mm -hmm. um, every single day of their life, every single day of their life, there has been a human in orbit since yes. they have been born, mm -hmm. and yep. likely for the rest of their life. How, how I, I had never yes. considered that before, mm -hmm. how incredible of a feat for humanity is that? You got uh, it. But the, the yes. problem is right now, there are only five astronauts mm -hmm. in orbit. We need yep. to get that number uh, much higher. And to do that, I think um, inspiring people, like, mm -hmm. like you mentioned, uh, helps a great deal. And as you said, looking up. But the mm -hmm. key is knowing when to look up, and that's where you come in. Yes. You've got uh, you've got <laughs> ISS above. We've actually got uh, we've got we've a table full of hardware yes. uh, going on. Uh, smorgasbord so, uh, of so ISS above. Let's start with what is ISS above. So ISS above um, is a product. It's a software product that runs on a computer platform called Raspberry Pi. Sure. So it's a non-edible computer platform. <laughs> um, I've tried, and it doesn't taste very good. Um, kind, kind of crunchy. <laughs> yeah, exactly, crunchy. And kind of make, metallic. <laughs> yeah, don't try this at home, kids. Um, so uh, and initially, what I wanted to do was I created, uh, this was actually the first Kickstarter version of the product that I created. I, you know, I, ha I took on this problem, which is I really want the world to be inspired by the fact that the space station with human beings in it are passing them by so frequently. So my first version, I created something that just lit up. Sure. It just sat on your shelf, you plugged it in, 
and the only thing it did was just light up every single time the space station comes by. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this was an example of the first version. It had a 3D printed case. And uh, that's really what it was designed to do. And I started off with my grandkids. Yes, I'm old enough to have uh, grandkids. <laughs> I know that's uh, really hard to sort of, uh, you know, <laughs> take on. Anyway, uh, my youngest grandson then was three. And, you know, a three-year-old, he couldn't read displays and things sure. like I've got going on the latest version, but he could certainly count flashes. So he knew if it was flashing blue, that it was going to be very, very soon coming over. And when it turned into a rainbow pattern, it would be, it's coming over. And he'd better say, Grandpa, the space station's coming by. Um, and, you know, he's now six. So I've been doing this for three years. But uh, but above and beyond mm. that, we were talking before the show, uh, you had one of these up at TWIT. Uh, this yeah. week in tech, right? Mm -hmm. so yeah. I, should, I should clarify what the acronym <laughs> means. means. Uh, uh, and uh, what happened there? Yeah, so uh, yeah, Twit TV yep. for for all of my English friends. Yeah, they laugh when when <laughs> I say, hey, yeah, I'm proudly on Twit TV because they suddenly say, because Twit, if you don't know, means an idiot in the UK. So yeah, you finally Here found you. They Here finally too. figured you out, Liam. <laughs> <laughs> so Twit TV, um, they had a show called Coding 101, uh, run by uh, uh, Padre. Father Robert Balliser and uh, and Snubs, who runs Hack Five, as well. And um, I happened to be up in the area, and I made contact with one of the producers. And I just he happened to be really interested in the space station. I told him what this does, and he happened to put it on the shelf of Leo Laporte's show, mm -hmm. his radio show, and it was just sitting on his shelf. And uh, he didn't tell Leo what this thing was. But during the show, the space station started passing by. So this little device that has, you know, helpfully ISS above written on it started flashing. And Leo just put it together. He said, this is flashing. Does that mean, oh, the space station is going by, ISS above? He just got it immediately. And that just uh, provided an opportunity to sort of, you know, get that word out there. So um, it feels uh, like what mm -hmm. I call the low-hanging fruit, right? Because mm -hmm. most techies, I think, are um, easy space geeks. They, they're, mm -hmm. they're just they're space geeks. They maybe just don't know it yet, right? They're mm -hmm. they're really engaged with the technology. Uh, they, they love their the you know the phones and all that all that funk jazz. But um, if you just give them a little bit of inspiration, just 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 give them be like, oh hey, just look up right now, yeah. and you will see five humans flying overhead. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. it, that could be just enough to tip them over and be like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. Uh, uh, the key thing is as well, it's uh, yes, it is about looking up when you can see it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm sure most people watching the show know that you can go out three or four times a month and look up, and the space station is passing by. It looks like a really bright star, but my product lets you know every time it passes by, which can be in the middle of the day. Sure. So, and that's particularly where an opportunity comes for education and teaching. But that first version, that's all it did. It didn't plug into a TV or anything. Uh, and I did a Kickstarter for this. I shipped about 160, 200 of them. Mm -hmm. um, and then NASA launched, oh, this is the connection with SpaceX. Um, NASA launched a, a new camera module in the trunk yep. of uh, the SpaceX, I can't remember, CRS-3 or something? I don't remember which CRS anyway, mission, it was one all of those, blurring together It was the this very point. first one that, that used the, uh, the actual unpressurized part of the trunk. Mm -hmm. And so that that's launched the, that's the this, part underneath the yeah, Dragon underneath, spacecraft. And yep. they used a, a robotic arm to go in and pull this module out. And they put it underneath the Columbus module. And it's been there since April, so it, it was commissioned fully on, online on April the 30th in 2014, mm -hmm. which was just after I shipped all of these. <laughs> so my little box was sitting out there flashing away, and I suddenly realized, hey, there's live video views of the Earth from the space station now being made available. And it's I called thought, uh, HDEV, the High Definition Earth Viewing Experiment, I believe that's, yeah. that's exactly it, yeah. So, and uh, I looked at how that was working. So, in fact, this is the orbit, showing the orbit. You can see the station is currently in darkness. This is a real so, ISS above, by the way. Everyone. Yeah. This is actually plugged in in our control room, and this is exactly what you'd see on your TV. Yeah, this is the new one. In fact, the space, th this particular one is actually configured as if it's somewhere in Kazakhstan. <laughs> and the space station, if we were in Kazakhstan, is going over. Because so, you can tell. So, 
yeah, you can uh, tell with it's, blinky, it's blinky. going blinky blinky over there. Um, so I realized that, uh, hey, I've got a bunch of these devices out there. They have an HDMI port on them. Huh. And I thought, can I utilize that video? And not only just be an inspiration for having people be present to the fact that the astronauts are above, but when they're passing by, particularly in the daytime, this live video from that camera system shows live views of the Earth, which means as it's passing you by midday, mm -hmm. right overhead, you'll actually get to see the whole, in, in our area, you'll see the whole of the area of Southern California. You, you actually can see yourself from space. Precisely, mm -hmm. yeah, you're a tiny little pixel you know, behind you know some blurry pixel on the screen, but nevertheless, that's that's what's uh, uh, accessible, and that started the story of how I then got connected with NASA because I looked at what they had created. The camera system only works when the station is in sunlight, so which is so for half of each orbit, approximately, it's in sunlight. Half of it, it isn't. So there's nothing happening uh, when the station is in sunlight. So uh, what I figured out was how I could use ISS above to bring all of this information to the TV and then automatically launch the video. Because what happens if you're a regular person out there in the internet world, you can look at this live video. You just go you sure. so Google you HDEB, HDEB and, yeah, yeah. and you'll get it. However, and it's, in, it's immensely popular, but there's a lot of people that get there and they don't see the bit on the web page that says, oh, if it's black, it's just because the station is currently in darkness. Wait a few minutes. Um, well, so ha ha 45 minutes out of every 90 minute cycle, it's gonna be yep. nothing. Precisely. Yeah, yep. so, so I actually called up, I, amazing, NASA's, NASA people's phone numbers are actually just online. 1-800, yeah, call so, NASA. Sort of something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I found the, print, the principal investigators of HDEV mm. and I called them up because I had a few questions about how it worked and uh, I literally just picked up the phone and, and uh, one of the, I contacted two people there. Um, I, I'm sure they don't mind if I mention their names. That they're heroes, you know, astronauts are heroes. The, there are heroes on the ground working on stuff. Yeah, I mean, you know that, you know, with the SpaceX world as well. Sure. It's, sort of like, mean, it's, it's all that. You're all, you know, People who actually make it work. Thousands of engineers for every so, astronaut, yeah. So I called Carlos Fontenot. Uh, he's been with NASA for over 30 years, uh, and Susan Runco, uh, and they were the co principal investigators of this uh, experiment. And the amazing thing was when I called them and I said, Hi, I'm Liam from ISS Above, they said, Oh, we've heard of ISS Above. It's mm. awesome. And they, they created a little conference call where I could. Answer. Uh, I could ask questions of their entire team huh. who built HDEV, and it was exceptional. Um, and then out of that, I got invited to, to go to Johnson Space Center. I've been to a couple of uh, um, NASA social events. Sure, I think yeah. you've mm -hmm. been to some of those. Uh, they were called twi tweet ups and yep, things mm -hmm. like that. We were next to them. We weren't part of them. We had oh, our tents next to them when we were doing like, mm -hmm. space shuttle coverage. I think we saw yep. you constantly. Like mm -hmm. you, you did a lot of the tweet ups when this, the final yeah. space shuttle mission, certainly, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so all, all of that stuff. So um, all of that has helped me get to the point where I am now, where there's now 1,700 of these around the world. Oh, wow. There's an ISS above uh, uh, in every single NASA center because um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a very self contained, mm -hmm. plug and forget device that just brings all of this. I call it digital signage for the space station. Sure. That's really what it can be. It tells you, it even tells you when it's going to be visible, um, tells you when it's coming over, shows you the orbit pass, and uh, displays those live videos. Um, and yeah, so that's sort of what it, what it brings you. Oh, did I say it also tweets? Yeah, it, so, so whenever <laughs> it passes overhead. Yes, whenever it passes overhead, it tweets with your message to the station. So since these have been out there, there's been waves of tweets when the space station passes over, particularly over the USA, because there's thousands, uh, you know, a, couple, a thousand or so devices here in the USA. So over any area, there's when the station comes over, you'll see, you know, dozens and dozens of tweets as it goes over each city and state. Now, what if we take the situation and flip it? There's a comment from Green Jim LL uh, who says, uh, "I wonder what would happen if they put the software on one of the pies on the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. Would it just constantly flash insanely?" Uh, 
So I have thought about that. Yeah. So 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 the real thing, right? Behind everything, what I'm about is having the world get present to when astronauts are passing them by. Because mm-hmm. I say that makes a difference, and we can talk a little bit more about why that is. But I say it makes a difference when people are aware that the astronauts are passing them by. It's sort of like a, an existential thing. Suddenly, oh yeah, we've got astronauts there above me. If you're an astronaut on the station, uh, what I would say might be a useful thing to know is when you're passing by home. Mm-hmm. So. Instead of it being ISS above, um, the same software, if they had it running on, they actually do have an Astro Pi, that's what it's called, <laughs> on the space station. It's a formal thing from the Raspberry Pi Foundation that runs code from schools all mm-hmm. around, the, uh, around Europe and the UK. Um, so if they had, the, had it running on there, the astronauts could configure it to be uh, looking out for when they're passing by their home. And so it would be uh, like, you know, family below or Mm -hmm. kids below or something like that. So every time the station goes over there, uh, that's what would happen. And I I can't say who from the station actually purchased one, but there was was an astronaut who was on the station a uh, a year and a half ago who actually purchased an ISS above for his family. Mm -hmm. So when he was on the station, his family knew every time dad and, or husband was passing so by. So that brings up an interesting question. Uh, so I'm going to uh, ask this question from our chat room and then ex- expand on it, mm-hmm. which is from Mr. Makabar. It says, uh, is it only the International Space Station or is also Tiangong, which is the Chinese space station? But let, let me take that even a step further. Mm. We're about to hit an age of uh, citizens in space, mm. right? It's no longer going to be an age of just five or six NASA astronauts. Yeah. Soon we're going to have Bigelow space stations. Mm-hmm. We're going to have a lunar colony. We're going to have, yeah. I mean, all of these things are real. It, it sounds like it's really out far yeah. out there, but it, mm-hmm. it, in the grand, it's not. It's yeah. not. So uh, will you be able to extend this to, hey, you know what? I'm taking a trip up to the Bigelow station. Here mm-hmm. you go. Here's my, yes. here's my space above. Yes, uh, absolutely. So at the moment, the, the, the product just works with the orbital data from, uh, for the space station. So uh, every satellite that's up there um, has orbital elements, just the two line elements they're called. That's what my system downloads and uses to calculate the orbit and where it is. So um, it's just a matter of of switching in a different set of elements or having multiple elements on there. The software doesn't do that yet, but it's definitely feasible to do that. So if you had Tian Gong's Mm -hmm. uh, uh, orbital yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, you'd be able to just say, okay, switch between whatever orbit. Actually, you could take that a step further. If you have the TLA from anything in space, Mm -hmm. uh, you would be able to track it. Yes. That, that's why I've registered the domain sat above, for instance. <laughs> so, so I'm thinking that way. The, the other key thing uh, about that, if I can just do a tiny little segue, name drop here, sure. is uh, one of the, I would, I would really classify this as one of the reasons how I managed to get ISS above in the hands of non-techies. And that was Bill Nye uh, purchased an ISS above from me. Um, in sort of mid, uh, yeah, July of 2014. That was Bill, Bill Nye, Bill the planetary Nye, guy. Bill Nye, the planetary guy, <laughs> yeah. that's right. Um, and uh, he happened to fall in love with what you're seeing here. At the moment, you'll notice we're not seeing live video. That's because the station's in darkness. Sure. But, uh, yep. mm-hmm. He uh, obviously is someone who is interested in having people be passionate mm-hmm. about space. Well, passionate I would say about all exploration, science, all yeah, science, all yes. Yeah. In, in the context of the planetary society, it's space exploration, but they've also really now been getting more involved in, I would say, in, in the human aspect. Mm-hmm. So, and Bill was interviewed by the Wall Street Journal, and it was, it, the article was 17 questions to Bill Nye. You know, whatever questions you be, you know, it's like, how many bow ties do you have? <laughs> do you ever wear anything other than a bow tie? And uh, and then oh, one of the questions, two questions on bow ties, yeah, <laughs> something like oh, that. Oh man, I, I, I might be exaggerating, but the other question they had was, okay, what's your favorite technology gadget? It wasn't this? His <laughs> question was, what's your most recent obsession? Mm. And his most recent obsession, he said, was this gizmo called ISS above. You plug it into your TV with an HDMI cable and it gives you live views of the Earth from space. And uh, his final line was, um, it's, uh, I watch it all the time. I watch it more than is reasonable. It's just a beautiful thing. 
<laughs> um, and then the next day that was in the Wall Street Journal, my phone that was getting emails when any order came in blew up. I had like a hundred orders that next day. <laughs> And the, on the on the messages, there were often messages like, is this what Bill Nye's got? I want what Bill Nye's got. <laughs> Whatever he described, I want that. <laughs> it was like a, when Harry met Sally moment or something. <laughs> it was, That's incredible. Anyway, so Bill sort of, he, he, he reached out to people who of all ages, who were just reading the Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. And they wanted that, so um, you know that's one way that you that you you know get that sort of uh, um, outreach out there beyond the techies, and I've been very grateful at that. So, so a couple more comments from the chat room. Mm -hmm. uh, going back a word a little bit, um, kind of to the beginning. You know, it is a self-contained box. Uh, yeah. So this is high definition Earth viewing right now, mm -hmm. uh, and it even tells you this is nice because this is part of ISS above the, the mm -hmm. title. That is not part of uh, HDEV it's at not all. Part of HDEV, no. uh, you would normally just see this feed, so you wouldn't actually know mm -hmm. what you're over. And we've got uh, what do we have here? We got a Soyuz. Yep, that's uh, the Soyuz MSO two or three. I can't remember which one that one is. That uh, one updated yeah. now. We're over the Sea of, of Japan. Japan. Yep. Yeah. So this is going to be leaving on June the first. I believe that's with the two astronauts who are going back down. Um, and uh, then this is a progress resupply vehicle. And this, that's a, a, a sort of um, solar panel from the Cygnus. Mm -hmm. So uh, kinda... yeah. Yep. And this is just one of the views. This, the, that camera module that's underneath the Columbus module has uh, really three different camera views. This is the rear camera view. And in a minute, so you've got to watch out internet audience, you should be seeing um, this getting uh, a lot bluer because it's over the Sea of Japan uh, what, and it's just just after sunrise. Sure. So this is the back view. Mm -hmm. So the space station's moving towards us this way, five miles per second. And uh, you'll see the Earth uh, below is getting a lot lighter because it's moving into sunset. Uh, sorry, so it's moving into sunrise. Um, and it, it occasionally does that, just lost the video, but it will come back again mm -hmm. in, in a... It's in live a, video a, from space. It's going to yeah. happen from time to time. Yeah, <laughs> and it's interesting. So this is a six megabits or eight megabits per second uh, stream mm -hmm. that is coming from an encoder on the space station. Mm -hmm. It goes, it's spread out via NASA's network of communication satellites, satellites called TDRIS, uh, Transit and Data Relay uh, System. And then it comes down to somewhere like in White Sands, New Mexico, I think. Uh, then it gets piped over to Marshall Space Flight Center, and then they demux this video stream from everything else, and then mm -hmm. they send it over to Johnson Space Center, and then they stream it to Ustream, <laughs> and then it comes to this. <laughs> a bit of a path to get to. Uh... <laughs> it is, it is quite, quite an extraordinary path. So I can just about see that there's, it's getting a little bit uh, bluer there but hopefully it'll come back. It looks like they've switched it into a mode where it's just on the rear, the rear camera. And the reason they might do that, you know, it's uh, so I know that they will do it f around June the 1st because they want, they want you to be able to see the undocking of this, uh, of the Soyuz um, when it leaves to land in mm, Kazakhstan. That makes sense, yeah. And when it's, uh, when SpaceX is doing a delivery, Mm -hmm. um, they tend to leave it on the down camera view, the Nadir view, because that's where you can see the approaching of um, the SpaceX uh, Dragon, and then it's capture and berthing. Now, so I believe could... H HDEV originally, I mean, this is a really interesting use of HDEV, but really, uh, if I remember right, because we're going back a ways, it was designed to try a bunch of different high definition cameras in space yep. and see how well they survive because mm -hmm. um, c camera sensors do not like radiation yes. at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have a ton of radiation in space. And so they yep. put just a, a bunch of different cameras, yep. in, like just commercial. Four office. different, Panasonic, yep. Sony, uh, uh, some others. And they're really just standard. They're not um, special CCD. space cameras. Yeah, yeah no. they are. They're COTS cameras. They're called commercial off the shelf. Yep. And part of it was also built by high school students with a program that NASA runs called Hunch, mm -hmm. High Schools United for Creating Hardware. 
they love their acronyms. <laughs> they, they do. <laughs> so now you can see it's getting a little bit lighter underneath the station, and you mm -hmm. may eventually, you'll, you'll actually, see let's go full screen to that, so you can mm -hmm. actually start to see some of this stuff, right? Oh, uh -huh. there you go, just right, right as I, that, yep. that moment. But there as soon as it comes back, we'll go full screen, you'll actually start to be able to see the Earth uh, mm -hmm. starting to form on the lower right-hand corner, and yeah. you can just, uh, Dad, if you want to just hang there for a little bit, I think it's mm -hmm. going to be an ab absolutely incredible shot. Yeah. So, um, and so the Earth is, the edge of the Earth is just, just about up here. And uh, yeah, you should see, that's, that's what it looks like when you're 250 miles up and the clouds below you are moving, you know, they're 250 miles below. And the incredible thing is this is a live high definition feed from space right now. Mm -hmm. And if a uh, space station was uh, overhead, if it was directly mm -hmm. overhead, uh, we would have, uh, you know, we get an alert saying, hey, what you're looking at right now is you. Yep. Have you now, I know that you can tweet out and say, hey, um, um, you know, I, hey, hey astronauts, I, yeah. I'm, uh, have you ever considered doing something where um, it tweets a picture, uh, like takes a snapshot and tweets a picture saying, uh, hey, here, here's a picture of what happened when I was on top of you, like. That is, yeah, so that's certainly something I've considered doing. Mm -hmm. Sort of like there's a point where, yes, waving and then anything gets tweeted out. It's certainly feasible. Uh, the Raspberry Pi platform has its own uh, camera system that mm. you can just install. Um, well, I was thinking and, more just uh, grab a shot of the HDEV. Oh, right? the HDEV. Right, so grab that oh, and tweet yeah. out being like, hey, it flew overhead, this is where and I was. This, this is, is, this is a shot from space of me. Cool, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I'll, I'll brand that. TM, brought to you by TMRO. <laughs> uh, Everyday Ask on in the studio uh, asks the question, uh, how does the uh, ISS above keep track of which astronauts are bored so it knows who to tweet? But it's, it's, not, yeah. it's not tweeting the individual astronauts. No, right? it's uh, the tweets uh, go to the space station. But you can, you can put anything you want in there. So if you wanted to personally give a shout out to uh, Peggy Whitson or... Um, uh, Astro Two Fish, uh, <laughs> who is up there right now, is just the the greatest uh, uh, first first time visitor astronaut um, uh, who's up there right now. You can put you can tag them in the tweets. The tweets go out via the at ISS above you Twitter account, but you can write whatever you want. So uh, uh, a few more mm -hmm. questions from the chat room. Yeah. Um, Rebel. Um well, what is that? Rebel Ace basically asks, is it also available for Windows? Well, I, I think uh, the point is it's it's not for OS X. It's not for Windows. It's no. a standalone box that you plug in. No computer required. No, it, it, it is its own computer. So this is, this is really what a standard ISS above looks like. But for people who are geeky watching the, the, this show, mm -hmm. uh, you that's can all, just... That's everyone. Yeah, so that's yep. everyone. Um, just go on to Amazon, buy uh, a Raspberry Pi. There about 35 bucks. Uh, my software uh, that just is a it, basically it's it's on this card that uh, that is here. This this micro SD card is an eight gig card. They cost like six bucks. Um, you just write the image for ISS above on here, mm -hmm. and it's not free. You know, I'm doing a lot of work here to sort of get this out there, but it's usually thirty bucks. But I hope you don't mind. I've created a discount code. Oh, you're allowed, absolutely. Yeah, so yeah. it's TMRO, and you will get uh, this. Will cost fifteen dollars. Oh, sweet. So you just get the download, put it onto a Raspberry Pi. A lot of people say, oh, can't, isn't there an app for this? And I would say, yes, there is. There are some apps that do a lot of what this does. Mm -hmm. But I'm a bit of a, uh, what's the polite term? Uh, it's a polite English term. I'm a bit of a bastard. <laughs> it's a polite English term. Um, I, I want to force people to plug this into a TV. I say that when, this is, when, this, when you put this into a TV, mm -hmm. it actually makes a difference because everyone who's in sight of that TV gets to take part in the experience. Mm. If it's something that's an app, it's on your phone. You know, your phone is your phone. You're using it for so many other things. You're using it to call people. Sure. You know, and I've got it beeping. You know, I, I have it beep when the space station's coming over. So my phone lets me know that. So you can get apps that do this, and they're wonderful, and they're great for the use. But what I'm trying to do is to have this experience brought to people's homes, sure. brought to people's offices. It's more about the inspiration than it is yeah. just the, yep. So, so I force you to buy this hardware device so that you have to plug it into but a TV. But you don't force them to buy it from you. You can go buy it off the shelf. Yes, and you then, can. So, yep. so some people are not geeks. 
Uh, sure, they, or just they, the or they, they just want the whole thing. So, yeah, so you can order it from me, and there's still a discount that will work on that as well. So, um, uh, and actually, that brings another point uh, from the chat room. Chris Radcliffe, a little bit earlier, said, uh, you know, there are a lot of schools and uh, situations like this where you don't want a PC to manage this. A mm. simple plug in machine beats a PC that needs management any day. You got right? it. And, you and that's totally the, got the value of it. Yes. That's the other advantage of just mm -hmm. having this, which mm -hmm. is um, you know, on your desk, which is you don't need to, yeah. there are no Windows updates, there are no no OS mm -hmm. 10 updates. Yeah. It just sits there and either, and if you this can't updates, plug it into a screen, mm -hmm. although you can have the little, what's... Yeah, the, so this is still a Raspberry Pi uh, system, but it's using what's called the standard Raspberry Pi touch screen. Sure. You can't control it using the touch, but uh, nevertheless, it's a seven inch HDMI display. They only cost like 60 bucks extra. Sure. And then the, uh, but it's inside, it's still a Raspberry Pi. Okay, yep. So, and then I use a, you know, a different display indicator. This is another Kickstarter um, uh, device there called the Blink, the Blinkum mm -hmm. uh, from a friend in, uh, in Pasadena. So, uh, so you, you, you can, oh, right. And yeah, so, so th you can use lots of different displays. This one is an, LC an LCD. This one is a, a, a little, um, strip of, uh, of LED lights. If I just uh, plug it in, it'll boot up, so you, you'll start seeing what, it, what that looks like. This one here is a, a Raspberry Pi Zero W. This one costs ten dollars. Okay. If you can get them, they're they're a little bit in hard supply. So there's there's over thirteen million of Raspberry Pis out there in sure. the world. Uh, so this one is just, and it all runs the same code. I also have one running on my. That one I think is here. incredible. That's e ink on your, mm -hmm. uh, right? It so is, that... although it's beta and it crashed. So, um, <laughs> e ink display, it actually keeps the it, it, it the display is, uh, uh, doesn't need any power. So, if, if it crashes, or in this case, or if you switch it off, it will keep whatever was there last. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but earlier on, you were seeing it was working anyway. So, but that's it. It's, uh, it's basically a, a device that I've, uh, it's even got silly putty here. See, huh. I love this stuff. <laughs> uh, Dutta, our control room Dutta, mm. uh, uh, mastermind of the show, uh, asks, uh, does it require wireless or an Ethernet connection? Yes, it does. Um, so either wireless or, uh, or Ethernet. So the ISS above itself has a built-in Ethernet port. It also has built-in Wi-Fi. So, uh, and the way that you configure all this is just using a simple web application sure. running on your phone or whatever. It's got a website, web server running on it, mm -hmm. and that's how you can configure it. Uh, updates come to it completely automatically. It's sort of like a, an appliance that just you don't have to worry about it. Um, so, because there, there are often new features that I push out or bug fixes. And uh, that's that's usually a very reliable way to get them out there. Uh, Big B from the chat room is asking, can it run on a Pi Zero? Yes, yeah. So, so that's this the is Pi so zero. this is the Pi, is zero, the Pi zero here. Zero, yeah. So uh, yeah, runs perfectly on the Pi Zero. And then uh, you know, I kind of I think uh, I'll expand on this. But Sarge Enzyme is asking, has anyone developed an app to integrate with ISS above? Um, but I think expanding on that, is there any sort of like API or SDK that allows you to integrate this, like more information in or out of this? Um, I haven't thought about that, um, so I'd have to sort of think about what uh, what that would be about. You know how that would, uh, uh, you know, what sort of systems that that would link to. I'm just uh, so I don't know. Uh, I don't know, think I have a good answer. It's to a that. solid maybe. Yeah, <laughs> solid. It's certainly so. In terms of my side of things, I'm pulling stuff from various uh, external services. So. Um, so there's time, like, you know, that image that was just on there is one that I've dedicated to this device. Sure. So it's pulling it from my server, uh, checking if there's a new update to it, and it pushes them down to the units. Um, the bit where you see the overlay of the, of the place names, mm -hmm. that's coming from a server that I've got uh, running that service. I'm calculating the place name that's below the space station, and then all the ISS above are going to me to that server to pull that information. So, so that's pulling information. But I, but I, I think what uh, your viewer was talking about was having something go the other way. Um, and it's certainly feasible. I've sort of thought of doing other things like SMS messaging from it uh, directly. Um, All right. Really quickly, three more mm. questions. Uh, this is from our Twitch channel. It's uh, Jarnies is asking, would it run on other ARM boards such as a banana pie? Um, so I have not. Uh, 
Yeah, ISS above definitely at the moment doesn't. Uh, I've certainly created versions that just run under regular Linux mm -hmm. distributions. So w and they they just uh, so I haven't made them available to the public, but I'm certainly you know open to sort of looking at doing that. Uh, so I've got versions that run under just regular uh, distributions of Linux, okay. and I've just removed all of the custom stuff to do with, you know, uh, blinky lights and things like that. <laughs> but yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Haldesk asks, so the high definition Earth viewing experiment is ending eventually. Is there a replacement replacement plan? Wonderful. That's a great, yeah, great, great. Th it's been a concern of mine for some time. Because uh, the place, the port that the that this module is on, is actually very anything on the station is really valuable in terms of real estate, right? People want to put experiments up there. There is um, a replacement experiment designed to go in its space, and it does has nothing to do with HDEV, uh, but it's been delayed and delayed and delayed. But it still looks like sometime in 2018, uh, this is likely going to be discarded. And the replacement is that what I've seen going on, NASA does know how valuable this is. Sure. Um, but they don't like have this is HDEV replacement. What they've been doing is replacing many of the, uh, of the cameras that are, that are around the station. Mm. They've been replacing those with high definition uh, cameras. Um, so, uh, you know, the pan tilt zoom cameras that, yeah. that some of them have. So, this is just one of the live streams. There is another live stream if you Google ISS Live uh, video. It's another Ustream channel. Oh, right. So, the camera has switched to the front camera view. Sure. And this is just, so, just an incredible view, right? Yeah. This is, mm -hmm. You look at this and you're like, oh, my, this is a live view from mm -hmm. space right now yep. from a craft with five humums on board orbiting the Earth. Yep. Right, and I, I feel like that should be text across the top. Mm -hmm. You're looking at a live view of space with crashed humans. Right about, I mean, it's just and it does go that way. When stunning. people say, "Oh, you, this is live right now," yeah, I'm seeing something. Wow, yes, that, and that is what's so amazing. So to answer that, what what I see, uh, what the team who've involved most involved in this, they've been concerned with making sure that other, the, the cameras are just, this is going to be something that will hopefully just be fed directly from standard operational cameras that are on there. Now we're trying to have, I am standing for having, you know, a special channel that is dedicated to delivering this, the experience of HDEV, but using some of those new camera angles. This is a great view to see, the mm -hmm. Earth. But it doesn't get you in touch with the fact that this view is from a place where human beings are living. Sure. Because there's no structure here mm -hmm. of the station. That's why one of the most popular views is the one where it's the rear camera view where you can see the station. Or the down camera view when Dragon is attached and you can see part of the, 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 the solar panels. Uh, another incredible view that I don't think they have is just in, if they did inside the station looking mm -hmm. out the cupola. Yes. Uh, so then you'd be mm -hmm. able to see Earth yep. below slash astronauts in the yes. shot. That'd be kind of cool. But yes. I, I realize that NASA's kind of... Yeah, uh, there's privacy things. That, they they privacy. certainly do. If you look at the ISS Live channel, um, that uh, that is controlled by flight controllers uh, at Johnson Space Center, and they sometimes do switch um, internal views to that same feed. So, and what I don't show you here is that there's a beta version. Version three I'm working on is what I call it a multi-panel version, mm -hmm. where you can have uh, four quadrants, and it now it'll feature ISS Live, HDEV, and NASA TV and the orbit all in one view. So it's best if you've got a big TV um, mm -hmm. to experience that. But um, so, but what's really there is that is that you can you can you can really see uh, just the whole plethora of different uh, live videos from the station. I think for version three, uh, as Vax Headroom in the chat room is saying, is asking if you're aware of Launch Library, which is a uh, 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 project from tomorrow. It'd be cool for us to get launch information in there as well through the free API. Oh yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. So that that's definitely something that I'm interested in putting in there because people who have this. Are interested in you know it's not just the space station it's other things as well. All right, so, before before mm -hmm. we get into our general questions, where can people find more information on ISS Above? You in general, and like where can they buy something? Yeah, like so ISSAbove.com will get you to the website, and all the information's there. 
you can either purchase complete units or get that download image. Do you have all of the, I, I, I didn't even look at the store page, but do you have all the different types no. here, or is it, it's, it's just the base, uh, it, it's really this is, one? This is, this is the one that, that you would get if you purchased a retail unit. It comes with this and a power supply mm -hmm. and instructions, and, and you know, that's all you need. Because I think um, I want that one on my desk at Company yeah, X. Yeah, that's right. This this one, I I was uh, I created this one as a job lot initially for uh, NASA because they wanted they wanted units that they could connect into their unlimited Verizon hotspot thing. Sure. And uh, their educators can just take it around with them. So I so I shipped about um, a dozen of these all around the country. Um, but these are easy to put together. They. Yeah. It, it, you know, there's like no solder. Just slides right in the back. It does. Yeah. It just slides in. There's there's a little bit of uh, just connecting uh, on here. You can see I've just this is yep. connecting the power through, but it, it's really really easy to do. Um, so uh, um, so that that's what I'd recommend there is that you just buy the components and you put them together. It's very easy. All right, our five general questions. Ready? Mm -hmm. All right, no right or wrong answers. All right. Uh, moon or Mars first? I. I still love the moon. I still, th uh, yeah. So we'll have to I, get you a moon first shirt. Then. Yeah, I yeah. know. Oh my gosh, there you go. I just, uh, I've come up with the world. I'm a bit embarrassed about that. <laughs> well, why, why embarrassed about that? There, I mean, there are technical reasons yes. for it. There's uh, oh. emotional reasons for it too. Yeah, I know. When you've spent enough time with people who are sort of really going for it. Uh, there, there definitely is, you know, there, there are the two camps. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We should just go straight to Mars or, you know, yep. I, I just think the moon is, uh, is just a cool place. I, 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 want, I would I want totally visit, I would visit the moon on a week-long vacation. Mm -hmm. I can't do that with Mars. No, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, and that's another it. way to inspire, right? Be mm -hmm. like, oh, hey, just look up tonight. Yeah. I'll be there. Yes. I'll be, you know, mm -hmm. I'll be on the moon. You'll probably see it unless you have clouds. Cool. Uh, would you go? Yes. I, I, I would. To the moon? Oh, to the moon, yes. I would go to the moon. To Mars? To Mars, I don't think so. And that's, uh, I'm just thinking of the of the timing. Sure. Of Gonna wait for them to get the indoor plumbing yeah, all fixed. Yeah, some and, of uh, that, yes, maybe get exactly. Maybe some greenery up. Yeah, I, I, I would be a happy camper type person where I, you know, I want, I want there to be amenities. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. Uh, when do you think humans will first land on Mars? Oh, gosh, okay. So I still think it's going to be in the 2030s. Early or late? Um, I'm going for early. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when do you think mm -hmm. humans will set foot on the moon again? Uh, yeah, so let's say 2025. Mm. No idea why that just sort of came into my head. I asked, I asked my brain. We're holding you said, to it. It's all right. It just, it just, it just, you're, you're responsible for 2025 now. It's right. All, it's all good. I got it. Uh, last question, and my favorite. Mm -hmm. Why space? Space. I would say why space, what it is for me, is that it's about everything that's great about being human. I think when, when you are someone who is involved with or thinking about space, it's a really great community to be around. Mm. It's inspiring. Uh, I think when human beings sort of really look beyond themselves, it provides an opportunity to look beyond our petty problems in a way. I mean, we've got you know really important things to deal with on the Earth. Uh, I think that this has us uh, all get an opportunity to sort of be connected to the world as a whole and to be responsible. That we're we're all you know, we're all at this moment in time, we're all here to make a difference. And I think working on things in space actually has a, a big knock-on effect with uh, how we are on the Earth, what we're up to. That is a great answer. Liam, thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday and joining us here on the station. I would uh, not rather be anywhere else. This I'm, so I'm going to build a couple of these, bring them to my uh, my desk over at uh, <laughs> Company X. It's going to be awesome. Gonna be awesome. All right. Uh, 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 thank you so much. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, comments from last week's show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. 
we see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. And we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get started with comments from our last show, I do want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are our Escape Velocity members. They've contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. We have also got our Orbital subscribers. These are people who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. And for this segment, we also have our Suborbital members. These are people who have contributed $2.50 or more, and they're going to get access to After Dark and all the other goodies that come along with that. Uh, and as well as, of course, their name in the show, because we are a crowdfunded show. Every single dollar helps. That's what allows us to do this week after week. To find out how you can help us continue to create the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. I am joined by uh, Aerodynamics, Capcom, and The Hologram. Uh, we are going to be going over comments from our last show. So, Capcom, your hair's pink. It's purple. It's purple. <clears throat> Take us away. What's our first comment? Uh, so, last topic was Kevin De Bruin and speaking about the Europa Clipper. Uh, although a lot less about his physique than I would have liked. Uh, <laughs> Those arms, though. <laughs> just saying, that, right? Those arms, were, they were crazy pants. Yeah. Oh my goodness. All right. Uh, first comment comes off of YouTube from Brad C, as it were. Uh, it's concerning that these developmental and testing phases are being delayed by problems that are clearly avoidable. I think the issue is NASA, which is a government agency, is regulated by political activity. Shouldn't technical, scientific, or developmental decisions be made by scientists and engineers instead of, pol instead of politicians? I say yes. Uh, uh, let's go around the room. Should the engineers develop the rockets or the politicians? Uh, engineers. Yeah, engineers? Yep, engineers. Engineers, yeah, I, we're, we're all gonna agree with you on that one. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the reason the politicians do it is because NASA is funded by tax dollars, right? And they want to keep jobs in their district, and so that's what happens. Unfortunately, it's a very short-sighted view, because in doing that, in forcing engineering decisions on the engineers, they almost always end up with a lesser product. Uh, they end up with a yep. product that is stupid expensive, uh, and um, it may get canceled. We've seen this. Constellation is a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, you just if 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 they went back to the Apollo era of, look, we don't know how. Just put people on the moon. That was that mm -hmm. was great. <laughs> to be fair, though, they had a much larger percentage of our budget at that time. So yeah. We'll see what happens. And I think I think you'll find most people will agree that the engineers should make the engineering decisions, but. Um, I mean, that's not the world we live in today. Yeah. Something that I will say for for this, uh, you know, James Webb, the man, when he was uh, the, uh, not the administrator of NASA, <laughs> not the telescope, the man, the actual man, he's dead now. But, uh, you know, he had a brilliant idea of placing all the different factories and all the different NASA centers in multiple states around the country so that it would almost force congressional support. So today, you might have these Congress people that don't necessarily care about space and the ideas that they come up with might not be something that we like in general, but the fact that they want to, you know, uh, 
make their constituents happy in their districts for whatever NASA center or whatever factory or whatever part of the industry they have in their area, it gives that support. And I think that without that, we wouldn't be able, even though we might not be fans of the space launch system here and other programs, at least they're, they're happening and getting this congressional support uh, because of, of things like this. So. I, I it's mean, complicated, be, but at least something's happening. This goes back to our roundtable discussion we have to have. I don't think we're not fans of the space launch system. I don't think any of us is sitting here going, we hate space launch systems. Space launch systems should never fly. I think fundamentally our... <laughs> uh, I think someone in our control room is not a fan of okay. space launch systems. Most of us are not a fan. <laughs> are, are, are not not fans. I don't know how to word that. I, I, think, I think the big issue most of us have is what, what we just mentioned, which is it's cost, which was created by yeah. politicians dictating engineering needs. Uh, yes. like, like you have to use solid fuels. Why? 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 Why is that for? Why does a politician say you have to use solid fuels? Oh, you have to use leftover shuttle. Materials. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, so. uh, okay. Uh, that goes to our roundtable yeah. discussion that I believe is happening uh, <laughs> June next month. This next month, July, right? July, I think yeah. June or July. Whenever we have five one shows in one mo month, one yeah, of those months with a J. All right, next up, Capcom. Okay, next comment also comes off of YouTube from Rocky Boulders. It says, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> could, could be worse. Uh, I love how Ben Kevin accidentally calling Europa a planet. Whoops. Well, with all the talk of Pluto's status, I'm really surprised you guys haven't talked more about the new geophysical planet definition proposed by Alan Stern and company back in March. Maybe this would make for a good roundtable discussion. <laughs> the problem is, it may. <laughs> uh, the problem is, I think that turns like our moon into a planet. It turns every moon in the solar system into a planet. It does. And it potentially turns asteroids into planets as well. I forgot how many oh hundreds of I mean, planets we would have just in our local system. It would but be it's, one of the biggest pains in aren't, the butt aren't planets themselves done. aren't planets themselves technically moons of their orbiting star so I now mean, we're splitting hairs now <laughs> that's what happens this is what happens when you reclassify pluto it's on you guys now it's like a never-ending <laughs> onion where we're just peeling layers and layers and layers back and it's just not going to end well uh, it's that, not going to end well this that is planet that planet song in in fifth grade is going to be amazing that's what i was thinking <laughs> That's going to be like a six-hour song now. Forget it. The uh, pneumatic device for that is going to be its own paragraph. <laughs> My favorite planet's the sun. It's like the king of the pilots. <laughs> Which itself is technically a moon of, of uh, you know, the black, uh, um, the black hole. Oh, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Mike, what, stop. What have you done? <laughs> Just, you guys, you, you astrophysicists. So let's reclassify everything. You should have left it alone. Planets. We screwed the pooch. Left it <laughs> alone. We Pluto really... was just fine being a planet. We blew it. You blew it. You blew it, kid. You oh. blew it. Next up. Okay. Ah. Oh. <sighs> yeah, that's totally the response you were expecting there. Uh, next comment comes off of YouTube. Uh, Eric, I'm going to pronounce this as Eric IRL. Uh, huh. It's the camera mounts that make the Cape Canaveral footage so good. They're based on the old anti-aircraft gun mounts and they're over 50 years old. They provide a rock steady platform for whatever cameras and lenses you put on them. Okay, mm. it's it's not just the camera mounts, it's also the humans running them. Uh, yes. You yeah, know, faux show. Sure. Right, uh, I mean, again, Bunch goes kudos, kudos to the humans who were manually tracking those shots. They were incredible. It was from the last SpaceX launch. I mean, having the right tools helps. Uh, two launches. Having the right tools helps with doing the job well. Absolutely, but that's only part of it, right? But you still have to know how to use those tools. I that's can... right. But if any one of those elements is, is out of whack, right? Yes. If you have a really great uh, person who can track, but they have just this horrible little, like, DSLR tripod, that's not going to be good, <laughs> right? Right. right? Uh, yeah. yeah. And at the same time, if you have this incredible stable mount platform, but you have someone who's never tried to track a rocket before, right. also not going to be good. It's a combination of all of the things. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, I mean, again, it just when you consider the distances involved, it was never, absolutely incredible. Never mind that they use telescopes for photo, or for uh, camera lenses. Correct. Well, yeah, you have to at that point. They are. Yeah. They're giant telescopes pointed at a rocket. The best part is uh, if you ever get the chance to see the part where they don't actually have the rocket in frame, 
It's a whole lot of, ah, ah, ah. there it is. Yeah, trying to hang on to it. <laughs> and actually, that's they lose it. They're just what, trying to find it for like three seconds. That's the secret little thing behind, you know, behind, again, <laughs> pulling back the curtain for a moment. It's not just the camera operator or the mount. It's also the people choosing the shots that the public gets to see. Sure. Because, mm -hmm. it, you know, everyone's like, I want to see all the shots. It's like, mm, actually, no, you don't, because it's a lot of like probably nothing. probably make you nauseous. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of nothing. Uh, I'm going to be sick. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, anyhow, I, I realize there are still nerds who definitely want to choose. Oh. They're like, no, you're wrong. I want it. But, you know, the, the control room does a great job with that, too. The, the experiment with that is... I was not... That, that was not me. I'm not patting myself on the no, back. No, no, no. But the, ex the, the easy experiment with that is uh, watch any sort of live event, mm -hmm. whether it's music or wrestling or sports or whatever it is, right? And then go back, anything that was broadcast, and then go back and watch the broadcast and see the things that you missed. Yeah. Because even though live, you uh, technically got to see all of the angles, right? I mean, you saw all of the things that happened all at the same time. You can't consume it. But you can't consume it in that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so Human brain doesn't work that way. Yeah. So it's just, it's a... It's, it's a cute little experiment you can do on your own. Yep. Uh, um, okay, so next comment comes off of Patreon, actually. Uh, this one thank is, you, patron. <laughs> thank you. Single thank patron you. who commented on Patreon. Uh, <laughs> this one comes from Tom Westcott. It says, uh, mixed feelings about making science cool. I don't want to bring it down to baking soda uh, volcanoes. Getting people excited about results is great, but we also need to get them excited about calculus, stats, physics, and biology as well. That stuff can be hard for a lot of folks. Absolutely. Yeah, you really have to toe a line, a very careful line, um, when trying to make science cool because you gotta, you can't dumb it down too much for people. That's not very nice. It depends on what um, your audience is, though. Yeah, you have to think about your audience too. You also can't like start doing calculus on a chalkboard behind you as well because then right. you're just gonna lose the majority of your audience. I mean, even people who know how to do calculus have a hard time doing calculus. So, huh. I mean, it's. <laughs> It's, it's not why it's an called easy calculus. Thing to teach, uh, so. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it that can be very difficult, and I yeah. think sometimes we have uh, some trouble even on this show uh, because we have a fairly wide audience, and we have had everyone from people who have worked on stuff that has gone out into space and bombed the moon, as we like to say. Uh, you know, we have rocket scientists <laughs> in the chat room, and then we have people who just Hi, randomly... Hi, Vax. Uh, we do have people who just randomly find us, like, uh, on Twitch, for instance, or YouTube, or Twitter, or... Hi, Twitch viewers. Uh, hello, Twitch viewers. Or also, apparently, uh, randomly in walk, doing marches in D.C. for science. Um, yeah. We have all different kinds of people who watch this show uh, and, and any show, uh, any sort of thing, anytime you are talking or evangelizing space and science, uh, you do have to take your audience into consideration. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes it's hard because you don't know your audience. Yeah. Like, I too. have no idea who's watching right now. I don't know what level to be at. So you just have to kind of find it. You do. You have to find it something in the middle that... Um, uh, isn't insulting to the people who know this stuff, but at the same time isn't over the head of other people. And little things like not using acronyms helps a great deal. Yeah. Because you don't actually have to use acronyms to sound smart, right? So that's that's one of those little itty bitty things that goes yeah. a long way to, you know, you're not insulting the people who know this stuff because right. they know what you're talking about. And the people who don't know what you're talking about can figure it out now. You're not throwing TLAs at them all the time. Oh, three letter acronyms. Uh, yeah. And I feel like uh, the, the, the biggest thing is, is how much time to spend on it. Like, even on, on the news story that I did today talking about Blue Origin and Aerojet, it's just like, okay, here they did a test on a part. Like, for those of you who don't know, this is what this part does. And, mm -hmm. you know, still trying to balance that but not take too much time to explain it. It's totally. the most important part that makes the rocket go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another really important part that makes the rocket go. What's the difference? <laughs> well, well, yeah, well, except that the, because uh, it was the power plant. We were talking about the power plant, right? Yeah. Uh, power uh, pack. Po well, power you know, pack, the yeah. turbo pump. We're talking about the turbo pump, right? Yeah, the spinny, yeah. really the spin fast. This, the jet engine inside of the rocket engine. Yes. And we've seen what happens when that jet engine fails. Look no further than uh, one of the Cygnus missions, the Antares. It took down an entire rocket. Yep. One. Yeah. Turbo pump failure took an entire rocket down. Yep. That's what they were testing. Yeah. Neat. 
Uh, yeah. The other thing to note, uh, just really quickly, not to harp on this too long either. Uh, too is, late. I know. Is, <laughs> is that uh, they always tell you when you're trying to write something particularly, you know, go with what you know. You have to go with what what you know, what you understand. Uh, you don't ever want to appear too foolish when you're trying to branch out a little bit. And uh, so that also, you know, if, well, <laughs> me doing math on air last week, let's not touch that one, shall we? Um, <laughs> in my head, by the way, while trying to listen to something that was so terrible. I'm so sorry for that. Uh, I was really proud of myself at the moment, though. Um, I don't remember this, but okay. Yeah. Uh, I, but then, so so there's that, right? So, and, and uh, not every... Uh, person that we have on the show is going to speak to you and that's okay too. So I think we just need to make room for all of those things being possibilities is I guess my point there. All right, next up. Yep. All right, next one comes off of YouTube. This is from Jeff Molyneux. Molyneux? Molyneux? Yeah. Yep, We're, thank you, Liam. Uh, <laughs> says, uh, <laughs> how does uh, SpaceX Falcon 9 first stage return back to landing zone without going to zero velocity during its space turnaround? See May first launch. Ah, so uh, what they're talking about is if you look at the uh, velocity meters on the SpaceX launch, um, uh, when it goes up, it reaches this apogee, the, the kind of the top part, and then it starts falling back down to Earth, but the speed never hit zero. You'd expect it to go up, go to zero, and then kind of going back down. And the reason it never hit zero is um, because it started at zero, which means that the meters are uh, Earth relative velocity. In other words, it's taking into account the rotation of the Earth. So it's not going to hit zero because we're, the Earth is rotating underneath it and we're taking all of that into account. Mm -hmm. And so uh, un unless you actually started going ag against it, essentially, you're just not going to hit a zero marker. Same thing with the altitude, by the way. The altitude, uh, you'll notice, that is, uh, it'll say stage two altitude is at zero. That can't be correct, right? Well, it's not incorrect, but it, the, the meat, the, Altimeter is not sitting on the ground at zero altitude. Sure, you know, it's way it's you know 14 stories high up in the rocket. So all of that's kind of nulled out to make the because you expect them to read zero sure. when it launches. When sure. when it's on the launch pad, you expect it's it's altitude, how high up it is, and how fast it's going. You expect those to say zero. You don't expect it to say you know hundreds or thousands of miles per hour and you know whatever sure. it is. 